I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about request autocomplete, nav icons, CSS preprocessing, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we've got a blog post on the HTML5 Rocks website talking about request autocomplete take my money, not my time. Now, this is not the name of a song. This is actually the name of a feature in HTML5 and the newest builds of Chrome. So what Request Autocomplete does is, as you might guess, it requests the ability to autocomplete certain pieces of information inside of a field. So you know, Nick, how your web browser will attempt to autofill different data for you at times unless you turn that off? All the time. Well, it turns out in new builds of Chrome, you can request certain data to be auto-completed for you. Wow. Now, you might be wondering where this would be useful. Well, it integrates with Google Wallet, so on a checkout page, it can actually request your credit card data. So that's going to be really useful for people when they're checking out on a website. It says a lot of shopping carts are abandoned like 97% of the time during the checkout process. It and sounds like it would also be a little bit scary if you didn't know what was <laughs> going on at first. But, yeah. That uh, that's true. No, it does ask you to authorize it. Like, you know how it says, um, okay. I would like to use your address book? Right. Well, it authorizes it, and you can choose whether or not to actually fill in the data. Well, that's cool. Yeah, so there's a really, really great and thorough blog post on here. There's even a video showing how it works. Um, but really, all you have to do is add an event listener uh, to certain events on your forms, and then the browser will actually request this information, and the user can choose to give it to the browser or not. Now, there's a bunch of different fields that are supported um, for payments. It supports email, all the different credit card information. Uh, for addresses, it supports phone numbers, different street addresses, country code, billing code, shipping code, and all that. So they've got just a really, really great breakdown on everything you need to know about using Request Autocomplete. Something that's really interesting about it is it's not limited to just Google Wallet. Uh, browser vendors could choose different sources of information to give to request autocomplete. Anyway, I'm really excited about this, so check it out. You can find a link to it in the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash go treehouse, or in iTunes, search for us at the Treehouse Show. Pretty cool stuff. Well, next up, we have Navicon Transformicons. Whoa. I think I'm saying that right. Anyway, Sounds like a, C uh, a web show by Michael Bay. It does sound that way. <laughs> anyway, it's this really cool uh, pen on CodePen from Bennett Feely, I believe is how you say his name. And you'll recognize this very common UI pattern of the three lines that you, know, you see in a lot of web apps and iPhone and Android apps. And you click on these and typically a little menu will slide out. Now, if you click on the ones here, they actually transform. Whoa, super cool. So that one transformed what? into a little loading bar. These will transform into arrows, and then you have a couple of other different shapes that you can make here um, if you want to do some math, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but these are pretty useful in a couple of different scenarios. So for example, with the loading bar one, you can actually click it and go back. Uh, for the loading bar one, if you had something that needed to load in, say something on the menu or something in a different context, you could go ahead and click that and it could show a loading bar to the user so they would know what's going on. In the case of the arrows, let's say that you switched over to a menu, so you clicked the, the three bars and a menu slid out. Now you can identify what that button will do in the new context. So you know, it could go back, it could serve some sort of different function. Uh, before the show, Jason and I were talking about this, and Jason very cleverly pointed out that while this UI pattern is being standardized uh, across many different apps, it's not really standardized in terms of its usage and what will actually occur when you click this button. So this is, um, this is pretty cool, and I really like the animations on it. Yeah, nice. it's re really well done. I, li I like the nuances. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've talked about the nav icon before. So just we have. Go back and watch every episode of the Treehouse Show. Yeah, it's somewhere in there. Except for the first few, those were train yeah. wrecks. Yep. Next up, we have a project called Pre-Render. Now, something that can be a little bit of an issue on your web pages is if they're JavaScript intensive, search engines might not be able to crawl them. 
Now, pre-render is a very interesting middleware for Node.js, Ruby on Rails, and Zen Framework 2 that when a, it detects a crawler going to your site, it will pre-render the page and serve that to the bot instead. Whoa, that's yeah. pretty cool. Isn't that insane? Uh, it's very, very easy to use. Here is basically all you need to do to install it in Node. Here are the instruction, instructions for Ruby on Rails. Again, very, very easy to use, and also in Zen Framework 2. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's basically no reason to not use this in your sites. That was a great double negative. Anyway, check it out. It's, uh, so wait, we should, we should use this? We should use it in our site. In your site. Got it. You're welcome. Yep. Two negatives make a positive. Okay. Uh, That's why this show's so positive. <laughs> exactly. Next up is a uh, processor or Pro CSS or that's it. Yeah, Pro Pro CSS or uh, basically it's this pretty nifty web app. It's actually available on the Mac App Store now as well. Uh, then you can go ahead and copy and paste your CSS in here, or you can upload a file or even paste in a URL. When you come to the page, normally this would be blank. I've pre-populated it actually with the CSS from this web page that you're looking at right now. So I've just pasted it in there and there's quite a lot of stuff in there and it would take a pretty long time to format this yourself if you wanted a particular style of curly braces or what have you. Uh, now this process button down here, will go ahead and do the processing. But before we do that, let's open up the options and take a look here. Uh, they have categories for neat, pretty, and awesome. Very descriptive there. Uh, but actually, if you do click on these uh, select menus, they will go ahead and twirl out these tool tips. Lots of little uh, UI uh, words being dropped here. <laughs> um, they will twirl out these tool tips and give you a description of what each selection will do. And they're pretty detailed and pretty helpful. So. They even give examples here, in this case, for the brace style. And everyone has a slightly different way of typing out their CSS. I actually prefer the default one here. That's how I was taught to do CSS, and that's how I still uh, like to format my CSS. But that's not always the case with everybody. Uh, there's a lot of different styles, and they're all perfectly acceptable. Except for indenting with anything other than two spaces. That's unacceptable. Uh, yeah, I would tend to agree there. But they give you the option there just in case um, you want to do that. And they have a whole bunch of other options here. It's pretty cool. You go ahead and click process. And once you do that, it will go ahead and spit out the formatted uh, CSS for you just like that. And you can go ahead and copy it or you can actually download it. So Pretty cool, and it's really handy, say, if you're pretty deep into maybe a framework and you're modifying some stuff, or you're taking an old project and updating it. Really great way to go ahead and just update all that CSS at once to a newer format rather than you know, wasting time just typing out spaces or line breaks or something like that. So pretty cool stuff. Very nice. Yep. Next up, we have a project called Fast Active. This is a set of JavaScript and CSS files that attempts to replicate the feel of a native app inside uh, a regular uh, web application. You know, one of those single, single page web apps. So oh, um, the web. Yeah, the, the web, the internets. I've been there. Yeah, it, great place. Most nice. of it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's it's really really easy to use. It's also really really small. It's ultra lightweight. It's only 449 bytes minified. That's practically nothing. So the way it attempts to replicate the native feel of an application is by removing the delay that's present in a lot of the different events, as well as changing colors and giving UI feedback immediately. The author says that one of the big reasons that native applications feel so much different than HTML, uh, JSS, and CS applications is because the visual feedback is not immediate. So he's got a set of styles that you can overlay and a bunch of different events that you can hook into as well. So anyway, really, really easy to use. It's called Fast Active. And uh, yeah, go ahead and check that one out. Pretty nice. Well, next up, we have an awesome blog post called Optimizing UI Icons for Faster Recognition. It's written by Ala Kolmatova, I think is how you say his name, or Molotov for short. And if we go ahead and look at this post, 
It's all about the psychology of icons. It's a really fascinating and in-depth post. And Allah makes a lot of comparisons between uh, real-world signage that you might see on the road and icons you might see in a web app. Now, he actually did an A-B test to study the recognition between solid icons and kind of these line-based icons, very similar to what you might find in iOS 7 in a lot of instances. And he discovered that there's actually no difference between the recognition of, of the two groups. So that was kind of an interesting find. What he did discover is that the shape of the icons actually has a lot more to do with the speed of recognition. And he points out what a couple of good shapes look like and what a couple of not so good shapes look like. And then there's a few other factors that he tested on. One of them is whether or not you have a representative icon or an icon that just kind of looks like the, the actual thing. That was actually a poor way of explaining it, but it's much more articulate in the article. <laughs> and uh, one other thing I do want to point out, he says that adding labels to iconography or using labels in conjunction with iconography is a really fast way to get users to recognize stuff. So if you do have that luxury, say, uh, for example, you need them to recognize something very quickly, like a stop sign, then that's really the best way to do it. So very fascinating article. There's a lot more stuff in there that uh, I didn't talk about. And like I said, he explains it much more articular articulately than I did. That was like the perfect word to That to really flub. was. Yeah, he there. nailed it. All right. Next up, we have a project called Stack Edit. If you've ever been to Stack Overflow, they have a markdown library called PageDown. Now, uh, this guy on GitHub, uh, Ben Wheat, that is his GitHub name, went ahead and made this huge, fully featured markdown editor using that library and a bunch of different technologies inside the browser. So first, I'll show you what it looks like. This is a uh, screenshot, I'm sorry, this is an interactive display of Stack Edit. You can see you have the markdown on the left side of the screen and the rendered version on the right side of the screen. Now, there are some uh, toolbar buttons that you can use to format it bold, and then you can see you get an immediate live preview on the right side of the screen. So what's so great about this? Well, it supports a ton of things. You can um, export your documents in Markdown or HTML. You can synchronize these documents in the cloud. You can import documents from Google Drive, Dropbox, and just a ton of different services. If you're interested in how this works, you can also view all the code right there. So it's a really great way to see what's going on behind the scenes and how you might integrate some of this source code into your own applications. I have it on good authority that the best way to learn to code is to break existing code. Not really, not really sure where I heard that one. Yeah, might have been on the Treehouse blog. Could, could have been. <laughs> it's very possible. Yeah. Anyway, that's, uh, that's all we have for, for this episode. Nick, who are you on Twitter? I am at NickRP. And I am at JCypher. If you want more information on anything we talked about on this show, go ahead and check out the show notes at youtube.com slash GoTreehouse, or check us out in iTunes. Search for The Treehouse Show. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile development, business development, and many other types of development, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.